Hello, my name is Ann Ellsworth. Thank you for joining me today. About a year ago, I began my journey towards becoming an anti-racist by taking inventory of the privileges I enjoy as a white, able-bodied, cisgendered, English-speaking, educated woman in a heterosexual marriage and a citizen in the country of my residence. Understanding these privileges as blind spots, most of which I inherited at birth, I felt about as confident moving forward as I did trying to find a middle C as a beginning horn player. A C, I soon found out, was not a C at all, but an F. As I began to listen, read, and practice anti-racism, I began to see parallels between horn playing and anti-racism to the point that now I believe I can not only become an anti-racist, but as a musician, I must become an anti-racist if I'm going to fully express my humanity in my music making. So the horn for me has certain physical qualities or attributes that feel really right to me when I'm playing, but which have absolutely no musical merit whatsoever. For example, I love the way it feels to like really smack a pickup note. Um, I was taught that that lower note is like a springboard for the higher note. Um, it sets my face up for the big jump and um, yeah, I just love to smack the pickup note to the point that it's louder than the downbeat. But um, it makes me feel more secure and it feels really good to my face. I have a similar blind spot when I come to a nockschlag. Love the nockschlag at the end of a trill. But instead of making a graceful resolution out of the trill and into the tonic, I get to a nockschlag and again, I just want to smack, smack it like, buddy da it's probably as loud as I can and just make it pop feels really good. What's the big deal? Everything in my instincts tells me that's a good thing to do. And of course I'm horrified when I hear myself doing it on a recording. It's disruptive to the line and it sounds careless. I am so grateful for recordings because while I am playing, I am seriously unaware that I'm even doing it. Once I know, then I can correct it and practice these weird effects that I do when I default to my physical sensations. When I let the physical sensation of playing guide my musical decisions, I give up my agency and I'm limiting my musicianship to the confines of my instrument. I'm in a white body living in a society designed for me by my white ancestors. It was built with forced labor on stolen land and my quality of life benefits from continued violence and oppression. And there are things I do daily and thoughtlessly that have no basis in morality. For me to say my life feels great is to underestimate the systemic nature of my racism. It feels right to me to feel safe, to be secure financially, to have access to education opportunities and healthcare. It feels so right that it's hard for me to imagine that it's not right for everyone. It doesn't feel great. So what's the problem? The playback of George Floyd's murder was the recording that horrified me into reality. I think it was for a lot of people. Now that I know, I can begin to correct it. Because when I default to my comfort and lifestyle to get my behavior, I'm giving up my agency and limiting my humanity to the confines of my race. One of the things I really love about horn playing is that I am only as good as I am on any given day. So I can play a great concert two weeks ago, nail the solos, stick the landings, as they say. Um, but if I show up uh, to a gig today and I'm not warmed up or I haven't been practicing and I'm not able to play my part, nobody wants to hear about how great I used to be or that time that I played two weeks ago, like, wow, I really sounded great two weeks ago. It's not relevant. Same with anti-racism. If I do not stand up as an anti-racist and intervene when acts of racism are taking place, large or small, then that is who I am as an anti-racist in that day. And nobody wants to hear about the time I did stand up or how I am usually better than this or about the times I did the right thing. It is a daily practice. And like my playing, my practice changes um, depending on 
what's coming up, what concerts I have, new repertoire. Same with anti-racism. As I enter new situations, different things are required of me. I'd like to talk about breaking the code for one second. That is when a white person goes against another white person in, uh, it's, it's what I was raised to be considered bad manners. I made phone calls because um, that was something I could do. And I would read about issues that were happening around the country and um, marginalized groups that needed help. And I remember the first call I made was to um, a very nice um, resort sort of hotel on the West Coast who um, was operating without masks or any sort of restrictions. And it was affecting the health of the indigenous nation that was in proximity. So I called them up and I said, hello. Um, and this woman answered the phone, sweet person. Hello, how may I help you? I said, hello, my name's Ann Ellsworth. I'm calling from Wisconsin. And immediately, um, those, that was a lot of information, even just in the w way I was speaking. And she was like, how are you? How's everything? Great. It's going well, thank you. Um, how can I help you? Uh, assuming that I would want to take a vacation out there. Of course, why else would I be calling? I said, I'm calling because I'm concerned about the health of your indigenous neighbors and um, they don't have the health care. They don't have the, it's harming to these people. And I would like to ask you to close down until um, the, this, this wave of, of infection passes. Silence. I started sweating. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I was really nervous. And she said, okay, well, thank you. And I said, thank you and thank you and I hung up and I felt like I had just threw I felt like I'd thrown my grandmother under the bus my sister who is also a performer um, told me about receiving a an award from a financial award from a foundation and they asked her to come and speak at this thing and she stood up there and she had her little speech prepared and as she started to talk she said, I knew that I had to acknowledge the fact that this money that I was receiving as a white person was uh, made from the slave trade. And you could trace it almost directly back. So at a certain point after the thank yous, and I'm going to use this work to further my art, she said, my tongue started to go numb. I couldn't feel my fingertips and I started sweating. And that is breaking the code. And that sounds like, um, performance anxiety, which it is. But guess what? I'm a horn player. So I know how to deal with performance anxiety. And one of the things we do is practice. And we practice by doing. To give and receive criticism as a musician is an act of respect. It's the acknowledgement of my ability to do better and it affirms the desire for us together to improve as a section or an ensemble. With the shared understanding that we are working together to make something meaningful, beautiful, intense, compelling, depending on the repertoire, <laughs> depending on the venue, having a respectful exchange of ideas and suggestions, even arguments, can be enlightening and lead to deeper interpretations and greater music making. It's how I improve as a musician, one of the ways and it should be no different in our interactions with the world around us. My fellow allies and anti-racist friends know that I want to do the right thing. And I'm grateful when they take the time to call me out, correct and encourage me to be my better self. It builds trust between us as allies and it strengthens our shared commitment to do better.
My instrument was traditionally used in sport hunting. I have feelings about that. It evolved into a member of the predominantly white Northern European Western Classical Orchestra, and I also have feelings about that. I love my instrument and what it becomes moving forward, how it is used, who uses it, who writes for it, what music it plays, and in what context. All of these factors are as much my responsibility as anyone's. Its history informs our present, but does not define our future. My family of origin participated wholesale in the colonization of this country. My mother's from the South. My father's side of the family came over on the Mayflower. My grandmother was a member of the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution. And I have a lot of feelings about this. I also have a lot of feelings about the many ways in which I personally and professionally have benefited from systemic racism. I take responsibility for my own actions and commit to my daily practice of anti-racism with the same love and discipline that I practice my instrument. Before we go any further, I want to quickly make clear the difference between the use of the words performing in the context of being a performing musician and performative as it is used in discussions about anti-racism. Perform performing is the action or process of carrying out or accomplishing an action, task, or function. Performative is something that is done or made for show as to bolster one's own image or to make a positive impression on others. My goal as a performer is to carry out my function, be it to make something beautiful, theatrical, comedic, grave, the list goes on. And when I'm performing at my best, I feel that I am at once totally exposed and completely invisible. The barriers between myself and others disappear, and I am a conduit for that most exquisite flow we call music. It is the goal I strive for and rarely attain. I keep trying. I know it's possible because I have felt it in myself when a great musician takes the stage and transforms my life. And it is not always a stage. I can be a street musician, a guitar player in a coffee house, a bird. My goal as an anti-racist is not so different, to be fully present, exposed, and invisible, a conduit for this most exquisite flow that we call many different things, humanity, love, respect, dignity, compassion, honesty, being real. It's not always easy to get there, but I know it is possible because I have felt it from other people. To be seen and heard for who I am is ultimately disarming, healing, and yes, transforming. I practice and I work to understand my instrument, how it works, its inherent challenges, and how I can make it easier. And as I reflect a lot on the horn, I also learn about myself, my limitations, my strengths, and what I need to bring to this strange relationship between hard metal and soft person. Good news, other people aren't metal. The strangeness we feel is not other people. It's the hardness of the world we've built that divides us. So what about the rest of my performances that do not approach transcendence? What do I do if my face doesn't feel right, I start to feel nervous, and my inner dialogue starts? I like to direct my attention to a quick triage assessment of my go-tos. Number one, am I breathing? Number two, where is the tension? Am I pressing? Am I closing off my throat instead of supporting my air? Number three, am I making up excuses for myself while this is even happening? Number four, am I overplaying? Then I get back to the music as quickly as I can, focus on my breathing and doing my job with all my doubts and triggers firing at once. And interestingly, I have listened back to some of my worst performances ever while filling out that same old application to law school. And they are often not as bad as I thought they would be. My overcompensating and focusing so intensely on my breathing 
something I take for granted when things are going well. Allowed for longer lines, a better sound, and even some of the technical stuff sounded cleaner because I wasn't relying so much on my embouchure. The point is, it's not about how I feel while I'm performing. It's about how the audience feels while they are listening. I have anxiety about being an anti-racist. As a white person participating in a society that for 400 years has committed egregious atrocities against people of color and benefited from their oppression, yeah, I have some feelings about that, including guilt, which arguably may be appropriate. Nobody cares. I am not the victim here, and me having feelings does not prevent me from doing my job. It's how other people feel when we are together. As I try to overcome habitual and learned racist behavior, it is important for me to remember that feelings are not facts. And if I start to feel anxious in conversation about race, I need to stop and take stock of what I am bringing to the situation. Number one, am I too loud? Number two, am I thinking about what I'm going to say in response instead of hearing what someone is actually saying? Number three, am I feeling the need to explain or fix something? Number four, am I feeling defensive? And then I see how quickly I can return to the present and stay in my discomfort without distracting people with my issues or making them a burden on others during a challenging moment. I remember some graffiti from an undergraduate practice room that stays with me to this day. It said, God is love. Love is blind. Ray Charles is blind. Ray Charles is God. I love that. And it's kind of influenced my own sort of mantras as I've gone through life. Here's my anti-racist mantra. My anti-racist logic. Playing the horn is hard. I can play the horn. I can do hard things. I can do hard things. Being an anti-racist is hard. I can be an anti-racist. And Ray Charles is God. I have to take chances as a performer and as an anti-racist if I'm to grow and improve myself. Be it laying a new piece, a new technique, or committing to changing my personal racism and the systems from which I personally benefit, I am definitely going to make mistakes. I will absolutely make mistakes. And when I do, I will take responsibility for them. I will make right what I can, and I will ask myself, one, was I fully present when I said something inappropriate or missed an entrance? Two, was I prepared? Was I in shape? Was I rested and mentally clear? Were my expectations for myself realistic? Number three, did I have an agenda? Was I trying to gain something, advance my career? Was I being political? Four, was my ego involved? Was I trying to impress myself or someone else? Then I reflect upon my mistakes, objectively and without judgment, because I have never been successful at shaming myself into playing better or doing anything good. And then I consider what I will do differently next time and try again and again and again. I cannot let my fear of making mistakes keep me from trying. If I stop trying, I stop learning and eventually I do nothing. As a horn player, I can never actually know what I sound like in a hall or recreate what the audience experiences in the moment that I'm playing. So when I'm in a new ensemble or venue, I will often ask another musician to listen for me. I'll ask them, am I projecting? How is the balance? Am I too loud? It helps me in other situations as well to ask for insight or perspective from someone who might have a better sense of how my language or actions might be received or affect others. I remember when Michelle Baker and I were in a rehearsal for a Baroque piece for two horns. Michelle was playing her nickel silver horn and I was on my brass horn. 
We landed on a middle register octave, and in the instant that it did not settle, Michelle switched to her B-flat horn as I jumped to the F side of mine. We were aware of the pitch tendencies of each other's horns, as well as our own. In the outside non-horn world, I think they call this empathy. Imagine I'm walking down the street with my horn case, and someone comes up to me, a total stranger, and says, I want to be a horn player, but I don't know how. What should I do? When I suggest they find a teacher, they say, well, you're a horn player. Just tell me what to do. It, if it seems ludicrous to you that because I have a horn case, someone would expect me to stop and educate them, I would guess that you might have inherited some of the same privilege I did. I actually am a horn teacher. And if someone, even a colleague, is serious about learning the instrument, I expect to be paid for my time and for the student to come prepared for their lessons. And yet, it is my first impulse to ask one of my BIPOC friends or colleagues to stop their lives, educate me, and give me not just their time, but the emotional labor of helping me unpack and process my own guilt about racism without remuneration. Educators and scholars have given their professional lives to the teaching and study of anti-racism. The information is out there. It is on me to read and study, take courses, join advocacy groups, and do the hard work of dismantling and owning my part and the systemic racism implicit in my history. Not only has horn playing given me a template for understanding and practicing anti-racism, it has positioned me to be a leader in this movement. I was taught to be an ambassador between the winds and brass section. I learned how to support a principal horn from the second chair while smoothing things over with the third chair. I also enjoy a certain amount of privilege as a principal in an orchestra and the ways white systems show respect. Money. The principal horn is traditionally one of the highest paid chairs in the orchestra and also access to power. Playing horn has given me an audience, a stage, and a community of musicians who understand and practice these concepts of equality, inclusivity, and diversity, and are committed to changing our institutions and music making to reflect these values. I want to thank you for joining me today in this very difficult subject. I'm speaking to you today from Appleton, Wisconsin, the traditional territory of the Menominee Nation. If you would like to know what my anti-racist practice schedule looks like or the etudes I'm working on, read more about my journey or talk with me, please feel free to connect by email at ann.ellsworth at lawrence.edu. Thank you.
what it is. Trueness is what it is. And sometimes trueness looks like what it ain't. to find you a new true and maybe even manage to raise your conscious level as you're striving to find the right road there's one thing that you should know if it's true today it won't become passe what is true what is true